welcome once again to Father Spitzer's Universe at the busy intersection where faith meets reason. I'm Doug Keck, kind of the gatekeeper. We're here in Irondale, Alabama on Mother Angelica Way where it all began back in 1981. Still going strong thanks to your support. Email your questions to us here at Spitzer's Universe at EW10.com. Check out all of Father Spitzer's websites, themagiscenter.com one, the Credible Catholic dot com and also purposefuluniverse.com and of course Father Spitzer's Universe is always available on our EW10 YouTube channel and our EW10 on demand page which is on our website you know while you're on our on demand page be sure to check out Living the Christian Way you know it's a new program in a secularized world marked by ideology and partisanship it's difficult to know what's right and wrong well Father Jeffrey Kirby examines hot button issues through the perspective of the Catholic faith, and it's free and it's on demand, so check that out. Our topic today, pride, as we continue through Father's very prideful book, Christ versus Satan in Our Daily Lives. <laughs> we're, we're proud of the book anyway. Available through the EWTN Religious Catalog. And of course, the book of the month for January from EWTN is Prayers of Desperation, A Questioner's Prayer for Answers in Our Darkest Moments by our great friend, former bishop here at Birmingham. Bishop Robert J. Baker, a great supporter of the network over the years. And speaking of supporters, we turn once again to Father Spitzer and ask him to lead us in prayer. Hello, Father. Absolutely. Hello, Doug. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your many blessings to us, <clears throat> the blessing especially of this ministry and our ability to serve in it. We ask you to send your Holy Spirit down upon us this day to inspire, guide, and protect us <clears throat> so that everything we do and say will be brought to fruition in your will for the good of your people, your church, and your kingdom. We ask all of these things through Jesus our Lord. Amen. And Mary, seat of wisdom, pray for us. <clears throat> in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So I, I hear a little coughing there going on. You know, we can't afford to lose you, Father. We just uh, lost two greats <laughs> in the church uh, between uh, yeah. Emeritus Benedict, uh, Cardinal Ratzinger, of course, and now yeah. uh, the great Cardinal George Pell. And I, Pell. Uh, you know, and I wanted to ask you, I yeah. uh, just wanted to read a couple of comments that George Weigel I was supposed to do an interview with uh, mm -hmm. with George actually last week, and he had to cancel it because of the fact that he was going over for the for the funeral. Uh, and and yeah. he, he has, has an article here uh, uh, that he wrote. Uh, George Pell, the encourager, he called him, and he, and he talked about the yeah. fact that George Pell had quite inadvertently said, but quite authentically, written his own epitaph in a talk he gave. He was a courageous man who encouraged others who gave others courage, or, or perhaps better, drew out of others the courage they did not know that lay within them. I know a few, if any, public figures who have displayed the moral courage George Pell displayed for decades. He's defended and promoted the truth of Catholic faith in the face of a relentless, vicious Australian media campaign to destroy him. And he also notes that uh, the Cardinal's uh, book, the first volume of his prison journal, I was able yeah. to be able to interview him about two of the journals. Uh, that was the last book read by uh, Pope Benedict. So I was interested in your interactions with him, your knowledge of him, and your take on him. Uh, well, you know, uh, Cardinal Pell was so good to us at the Magis Center. Um, <clears throat> when I was in Rome, I actually asked him, um, you know, if he would sit on our ecclesiastical advisory board, and he said yes right away. And uh, he was always so hospitable to us. He'd always invite us over to his uh, home for dinner. And, and uh, you know, uh, I mean, I admired the fact that he could just, you know, get up and debate Dawkins or something mm -hmm. at the drop of a hat. He, he was truly fearless. I mean, he, he was very witty. Uh, mm -hmm. He was very informed. He was very intelligent, and he went after a lot of people in the Vatican that needed uh, reform. Uh, unfortunately, I think he was just 
um, uh, terribly, terribly uh, persecuted mm -hmm. uh, in this uh, law case. And I think there was a, a very good reason for the Supreme Court of uh, uh, Australia there to uh, overturn the entire mm -hmm. proceeding uh, unanimously because, I mean, if you look at it, one of the so-called victims, um, you know, uh, uh, quit and said he lied, mm -hmm. and the other one uh, uh, was there who, uh, you know, uh, you know, gave a testimony that, that looked incredibly similar uh, mm -hmm. to a Rolling Stone article that had come out a couple of years earlier, and you know, a variety of other things like, you know, the sacristy uh, uh, where he supposedly did all of these things was as busy as, uh, uh, the, you know, the Grand Central uh, train station there. Mm -hmm. um, so um, my, my thought is, uh, is um, um, I, you know, I think he was persecuted. I think the Supreme Court recognized the injustice done to him. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, uh, not nearly enough people uh, who were involved in that um, uh, so-called, uh, I'll just say kangaroo court, right. uh, apologized for the outrage. But at least the Supreme Court did acknowledge uh, the absence of evidence and did unanimously mm -hmm. overturn the decision. So I, but like I said, he was fearless. And, he was such a hospitable, good, and humble man uh, to me. I, I mean, he, he was a man of service. He, he really did uh, see the need, um, you know, to evangelize the church, you know, through using a contemporary science and philosophy, which is my area. And, uh, you know, it's always nice to be appreciated. But he was, um, he had uh, so many different uh, capacities, so many different levels, and and so uh, of, um, of uh, thought. So I, um, uh, you know, I, I mm -hmm. m you know, mourn his passing right. because he was always a friend. Right. I mean, I could always just walk up to him and just chat with him. Uh, you know, I just was at, uh, um, you know, a Caritas and Veritate uh, um, event um, with him and I uh, had a very nice chat with him. And, um, you know, uh, alas, you know, um, the next thing you know, uh, he's deceased. Right. And, um, um, yeah, I mean, uh, for a hip surgery, uh, I'm not sure how it happened, uh, but uh, anyway, uh, I do regret his passing, and I, I do right. mourn it. I think it's a real loss to the church, Absolutely. and I think those prison uh, journals will be a real classic um, uh, going forward. Right, absolutely. They're, they're really enjoyable to read, insightful, and like you said, funny, interesting. Uh, mm -hmm. All of those things uh, are included in there, and uh, I'm sure he'll mm -hmm. have a great legacy going forward. Uh, and we need more like them. Uh, let's go to some other articles uh, for some things recent, because uh, uh, of course coming up this weekend, we have the, on Friday, this is the March for Life, the events happening in Washington starting Thursday yeah. night. And of course we've got the One Life LA event and also the Walk uh, for Life West Coast, which we carry as well. So there's a lot of things going on in the pro-life movement. So. One of the uh, pro-life uh, stories I saw I thought was interesting because we've talked about the famous Pearl, Paul Ehrlich in the past who is uh, still with us. Uh, he, he was featured on 60 Minutes um, and uh, this point, mm -hmm. this was an article in the National Review that picked on um, the idea that CBS disgraced itself, their point of view, by broadcasting the doomsday claims of biologist Paul Ehrlich with hardly any qualifications on 60 Minutes. Ehrlich now is 90 years old, has been publicly and confidently making completely wrong predictions for longer than most people have been alive, as we know, right? <laughs> um, and, yeah. right, a absolutely, his book in 1968, I remember yeah. it, The Population yeah. Bomb, predicted mass starvation in yeah. the 70s and 80s, yeah. only have global extreme yeah. poverty, hunger go into steep decline. Yeah. His predictions of increasing resource yeah. scarcity led him to make a wager with an economist named Julian Simon in 1980 that yeah. five commodities would become more expensive by 1990. The real price of all declined. And the point they make here is the CBS yeah. did not include a single person pushing back on his continued alarmism. You know, Ehrlich makes the same analytical yeah. errors, and this is the point you made last time we talked, that he made yeah. in his famous argument with Seinle, namely that humans won't adapt to new circumstances. 
Yeah, no, I mean, this is, a, um, you know, uh, Paul Ehrlich is a perfect representative of a, a bygone age of Malthusianism that has been overturned and disproved a, a thousand times. And, I mean, he just keeps repeating it like a broken record. Uh, and, of course, if 60 Minutes, if that's the best they can do uh, to put together for us a contemporary, um, you know, a politically and economically valid kinds of uh, news broadcasting that might not only be be of interest, but something new. Well, bringing out this hackneyed kind of, uh, uh, you know, overpopulation explosion when half of the scientists in the world are saying, no, 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 mm. it's not going to be a population explosion. In, 19, uh, in 2076, it's going to be a population implosion of immense proportions that will have economic effects throughout the developed world unseen of unparalleled before. And so, of course, uh, how, how early, uh, you know, can, you know, in the face of all of this, in the face of absolutely, uh, you know, indisputable demographic data showing the implosion, uh, in the face of China uh, experiencing so much po underpopulation, right. they just had a decline. About right? Their, uh, yeah, they just, right, exactly. just posted they had a decline for the first time. Yeah. Right? Oh, I know, but they're, they're, of course it's going to affect them. They're on the, the, you know, the, 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 you know, the edge of, you know, kind of economic, you know, debts, uh, you know, taking over uh, their capital, um, you know, and the, and the underpinning of their real estate market just falling out. And, and it's because of underpopulation, uh, a deliberate thing they've been doing, they can't get their population now to get over a, a one-child policy. And so, of course, uh, they're now experiencing, you know, an early uh, implosion effect a and uh, here's Paul Ehrlich, you know, bringing out this stuff. It's almost hilarious and CBS almost lodding it in the background. Right, well, I hate to say it, and but we, it is, and when it's we a wonder, little humorous. But it, <laughs> right, but it's sad because it's, it's the reason also that so yeah, many sad, people yeah. are still walking around yeah. with this general concept that there's overpopulation, yeah. and here's here this guy's back on yeah. 60 Minutes, and somebody's sitting there watching it Sunday night and thinking, yeah, yeah, this is still yeah. a problem, right? Yeah, I can see that, <laughs> right? Well, yeah, no, I, it is sad, and and, and uh, yeah, I, I should be corrected, um, you know, but. Uh, well, I mean, I can correct it on EWTN, but there you uh, go. Right. Uh, I do think you're right. It needs to be uh, something needs to be said on, on CBS itself because right. there is uh, countervailing opinions. I mean, from a million different quarters that say, you know, Ehrlich is so wrong and his, his you know, statistical base goes back, you know, almost to the times of Thomas Malthus himself. I mean, it needs a little bit of updating, right. but I shouldn't be so sarcastic, but uh, it is uh, uh, unfortunate right. that... Um, uh, that uh, you know he's being dragged out as representing right. something that's au courant, you know. I mean, au contraire. Right. So uh, that's the uh, well, the problem. You know? It's interesting. I, I read an article recently uh, coming out of uh, as we are now. It's it's amazing how quickly we're out of the Christmas, at least uh, the December though for a Catholic Christmas yeah. season. You know, has just ended really recently. <laughs> but uh, yeah. how much Malthus, yeah. if you want to understand Malthus, go to Dickens and the Christmas Carol and listen to Scrooge. Because no. Scrooge basically oh, is, I agree. is a supporter of the Malthus position. About poor oh, people. Oh, yeah. No, the two people of. Oh, yeah, two people approach him and, and say, oh, Mr. Scrooge, would you like to make a, mm -hmm. a contribution? No, no. Uh, aren't there any um, uh, workhouses? Oh, well, yeah, there are workhouses. Uh, well, aren't there any prisons? Well, yeah, there are, uh, prisons, you know. Uh, aren't there any, you know, debtors prison? Well, yeah, debtors prison. Well, I pay my taxes for those institutions. I think I've done enough. But, Mr. Scrooge, most people would rather be dead than in those places. Well, let them die, then, if they must. It'll take care of the service plus population. Right. Right. Yes, that's Malthus, pure and simple. Mm -hmm. Pure and simple. So, yeah. if you want to identify with overpopulation, you can identify with Scrooge. Moving on Mr. to Mr. Scrooge. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <Right>. So, <laughs> uh, I thought this was an interesting <laughs> just aside that the, uh, I think we mentioned it yeah. earlier, but officially the Catholic Diocese of Des Moines, Iowa has issued new policies that ban transgender girls for playing school and church sports against natural born girls. It also restricts bathrooms and locker rooms to use only by birth gender, not chosen gender. 
and by the bishop there, William M. Not sure how you pronounce his last name, Johnson, Johnson, Johnson. But anyway, yeah. we, we wanted to have a shout out for him for standing up for the truth, because you I'm sure bet. he's Absolutely. going to have a target on his back now uh, by all of the oh, yeah. uh, the uh, uh, pain and anguish groups, uh, as Father Fess used to call them, who all have problems with this about how yeah. terrible something that makes total natural sense to everybody, which everybody would have agreed with 10 years ago, but suddenly to think yeah. this, uh, you know, you're a total Luddite. Yeah, but, you know, just remember the pushback in Florida mm -hmm. by uh, um, uh, Ron DeSantis uh, worked very, very nicely. And just remember, too, all the pushback that's going on with all the wonderful parents that are going now uh, to their, um, you know, schools, um, uh, supervisory committees and, and so forth. It's actually working very well. And so uh, we're beginning to see that pushback right. does work. I mean, it's going to cost you. You may get canceled uh, and so forth, but the pushback is working. And by the way, the pushback, it's, you know, long overdue. Mm -hmm. I mean, even the, the British government is pushing back. Right. I mean, even they are saying, let's stop these, uh, these sexual reassignment surgeries and this, um, you know, uh, supposed, you know, support for, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, transgenderism right. and for, uh, uh, you know, prepubescent, um, you know, uh, uh, gender, uh, I mean, uh, hormone control, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, uh, all of this gender affirming therapy is, uh, you know, at least if it's being pushed back by a government right. in, in Great Britain who's used to be ahead of the game, uh, you know, quote unquote. Right. Uh, I think let's just take a second look at this and listen to some of these detransition people who are complaining bitterly that their lives have been ruined because not only, um, you know, the medical establishment, um, but also all of the people who've been encouraging this finally got to their parents who in turn encouraged them to, to transition, get a sexual reassignment surgery, and now, of course, um, they experience uh, the effects of it, the, the 20 times increase in, in suicides to, uh, you know, about 34 percent of that population. And, and furthermore, um, that they are also experiencing uh, the increased depression and anxiety uh, after the uh, five years after the transition uh, has taken place. So my thought is, well, you know, finally, uh, reality is beginning to set in, not to mention the fact that, you know, you've got uh, natural born males competing uh, with uh, with females on the playing field. Mm -hmm. It's not working, obviously. Uh, you know, there's a uh, hundred reports that women don't want this at all. Mm -hmm. This is not the kind of equality um, that's going to help matters at all. And having, you know, males in the, in, you, mm -hmm. know, you know, natural uh, biological males in the, in the women's locker room, how, how does that help matters any? You know, uh, according to somebody else's feeling. What about the feelings of all the other people who have to deal with this guy? I mean, uh, the, the whole thing is, you know, really uh, you know, ridiculous. And, and finally, you know, uh, the Bishop Johnson there has is, is really uh, responded to it in a, in a, I think, very profound and good way. So, right. Hale, good, good for him. Right. A absolutely. So uh, <laughs> just before we get to some uh, questions here, there, there was a story that jumped up at me. This uh, particular priest was giving a talk on some kind of stuff uh, that sometimes we talk about. And, and he points out that basically these days the science is actually pointing to a creator. Um, he goes on to yeah. say that scientists can measure the entropy or level of disorder in the universe. The level of entropy in our mm -hmm. universe is extremely low. Any higher, any life could, could never have developed. The odds against a low entropy universe is like the ones mentioned with the monkey and the typewriter. So unlikely... Yeah. It's, it's absurd. There's dozens of other examples, etc. And it goes on to say mm -hmm. that putting it all together, our universe is enormously improbable. We live in an incredibly difficult to explain, perfectly designed for life universe. So I, I just thought that was somebody you'd probably yeah. agree with. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, that guy's right on. And of course, the uh, uh, the uh, the odds of our low entropy universe occurring by pure chance. He's uh, absolutely correct. It's ten raised to the ten raised to the one twenty three to one. That double exponent means that uh, you know the exponent is basically ten, and then in the exponent raised to the 
trillion, 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 in the exponent, which means that that's about the same odds of a monkey typing the entire corpus of Shakespeare by random tapping of the keys in a single try. So that guy is 100% correct. That's right. What's amazing is what would be odds be that his name was Father Robert Spitzer? <laughs> oh, uh, what, what article are you reading? <laughs> this is from a talk you gave at the, the Word on be Fire. Very good. For your recent Word on oh, Fire yeah. talk you gave. That's what it's from. Oh, yeah. I wanted to see yeah, if you yeah, recognize your own words. <laughs> Well, no, I, I was just going to say that guy is certainly, you know, right on the marker. But, yes, I agree with that guy. <laughs> that's right. I, I wanted to see if you disagreed with anything he said, but that's okay. <laughs> no, I didn't realize that it, that it got covered in the press. <laughs> Good. Okay, let's move on to some uh, questions from some of our viewers. <laughs> Dear Father Spitzer, uh, I love your program, and EW10 is so important to me. We appreciate that. I recently learned that because of a medical condition, I have about six to 18 months to live. Is it selfish to focus prayers on my health for which I would need a miracle, or should I direct my prayers for others? I lived a sinful past, but for the last 15 years came close to Jesus and his mother. I think I will be ashamed to see Jesus for my past deeds, although I know he loves me and he has forgiven me. Jeff. Well, Jeff, you're right. Um, he has, he loves you, and he has forgiven you. That's for sure. And I can tell just by your words how sincere your contrition is and was. Mm-hmm. So the first thing um, to note is you're you're just fine. And of course, it's not selfish to focus on that. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can focus on both. You can offer up what you're suffering now and the shortness of your life and kind of the anxiety that that produces in its own way. Offer all of that up. Um, you know, for others in the world, especially the people you know and have contact with who might be uh, feeling uh, terrible, uh, you know, at this time or having real troubles at this time. So that might be the, you know, your self-offering. But of course, you know, pray for what you need. And what you need is is healing of your health. Why I would say I would pray for that. I mean, I pray uh, for an end to my blindness, um, you know, even though I'm, I offer my blindness us up at the same time and uh, you know the bumping into this that and the other thing you know I offer it up to uh, uh, for all the people I know and people I don't know the souls in purgatory and also the souls in most need of God's help throughout the world and so um, uh, it's a great double offering you've got both of them there and I'd say like a child crying for both do both right absolutely absolutely Next up, uh, dear Father Spitzer, I have a hard time trusting in God's providence and plan for me. I've been trying to do better, but I also Mm -hmm. don't want to be presumptuous and think God will take care of all my problems for me. Do you have any advice on how I can find balance between these two things, Louise? Well, Louise, you know, that's a, a, a really good question. I mean, we've all heard the expression, God helps those who help themselves. Well, Yes, he does, uh, in a way, but he doesn't, um, um, you know, he, he also doesn't want to help people who really think they can do it all themselves. If you think you can do it all yourself, you know, to, you know then uh, you probably don't need God's help. Uh, the old Pharisaical, you know, auto dikaiosune, right, the, the old uh, self-righteousness there. Mm. So the, uh, the idea would be, um, you know, for me anyway, is of course I, uh, you know, I want to act, as St. Ignatius of Loyola would say, as if everything depends, uh, I mean, uh, uh, pray as, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, act as if everything depends on me but pray as if everything depends on God. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that's a really good philosophy. That's right out of the playbook of St. Ignatius of Loyola. And uh, so pray really hard um, that God will help you, will take care of it, but act as if everything depends on you. Again, there's no dichotomy between, Mm -hmm. you know, being self-efficacious and acting for a particular end and praying that God will help in carrying out that end. Mm-hmm. Uh, the one thing we don't want to do is pray and not act. Right. Uh, you know, that's the old, well, you should have bought a lottery ticket joke. Right. So, uh, you know. Or, or the guy, or, I, you, you or the, cast, the castaway <laughs> on the island, right? 
with uh, you know yeah. the guy in the boat and the guy and then he <laughs> says well I thought you were gonna save me yeah, I you sent you a boat I sent you a helicopter <laughs> I, you know <laughs> but you, did, you didn't get right, in <laughs> right so right right uh, so true uh. okay. okay let's move into the next yeah. uh, one uh, dear father Spitzer yeah. I'm sorry these are some of these are kind of sad in some ways I'm 42 years old, yeah. disabled in a wheelchair, and sterile due to having cancer several years ago. What are my options from a Catholic viewpoint if I ever wanted to start a family, Steve? Well, Steve, I mean, there's a couple of really good, important options. The first one of, uh, is, um, I, I, I'm not sure whether you have a wife or not right now, but if you do uh, not have a, a wife, uh, of course, the first thing to do is uh, there are all kinds of dating websites that are Catholic dating websites that you may want to try and um, uh, post, uh, you know, yourself on and, you know, just be truthful about, um, you know, what your condition is. Mm -hmm. uh, you would be surprised uh, how many people are out there who would love to be with a person like yourself. If you already do have a wife, adoption is a great thing to do. I know so many families mm -hmm. um, in which, the, you know, um, adoption has proven to be uh, so good. And I know so many children that have been raised uh, by adoptive parents uh, that, um, you know, have uh, uh, come out so well, are so good, so productive, so, um, you know, virtuous in, in their conduct and, and have done so mm. much for the kingdom of God. So adoption is just a great way to go. And, um, you know, I, I know there, you know, sometimes if you adopt a little bit late, um, you know, you, you may want to have, um, um, you know, a, uh, uh, you, you got to have a certain kind of patience and temperament mm -hmm. uh, to do that. Um, but if you adopt uh, as, you know, uh, early, uh, that right. certainly um, uh, provides for a very good opportunity to have a family. So that might be um, uh, one approach uh, to doing things. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, maybe the best approach to doing things. And uh, there's a lot of good possibilities for you, Steve. So, uh, Right. Uh, hang in there and, um, know, as they say, take the actions you need to take right. um, to move that dream along. I'm sure you'd be a very good father with the faith that you have. Right. And, and for these children who are out there who are, who are looking to be adopted yeah. too and, and being in some ways a savior of salvation for that person in their particular life. You know, uh, Aaron Judge, who played you for bet. the Yankees, who broke the, he was adopted, you know, he, he was raised by... Yeah. Uh, adoptive parents. There's so many other people. Uh, Steve Jobs was adopted. So there you have yeah. people who could have easily have been aborted uh, and you know oh, yeah. wouldn't be here with us today. And we can only imagine how many <clears throat> wonderful people we're missing. So uh, uh, we've got a couple oh, of minutes left. You know, when I was. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. No, Go I was ahead. just going to say when I was uh, working in a, a hospital in Portland. Uh, you know, I, I had the, you know, these two little kids um, that came in, they were about, you know, um, s seven years old and I think uh, nine years old, and their parents both died in an automobile accident, but the little kids were in the back seat, survived. Mm -hmm. And so, um, uh, you know, I had luckily known a doctor um, who could arrange for an adoptive uh, family right away, and the, this family took both of them mm -hmm. together. Well, make a long story short, uh, about 16 years later, um, uh, no, uh, about 13, 12, 13 years later, I'm walking across the street in Portland, um, and uh, I hear this kid say to me, hey, Father Spencer, mm -hmm. you know, and of course I look back and he says, do you remember me? And of course by this time, you know, the kid had grown up two feet, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm looking at him, I said, well, not exactly, and he goes, I'm the guy, and he told me the whole story, and I said, well, are you happy? He says, I'm, you know, very happy, and he says, you know, I've got this going on, and I won this award, and I've done this, and I'm, I'm just getting ready to apply to colleges, and I just wanted to thank you so very much. I said, oh, no, thank the doctor. Uh, I better not mention his name mm -hmm. on, the, on the television, but he was such a great doctor, and he, he put this thing together so quickly. Mm -hmm. But anyway, the long and short of it was, uh, there it is. You know, adoption, it really does work. And this kid was just blunt testimony. I said, how's your sister doing? Everything's great with her. So I said, oh, my gosh, there it is. Uh, you know, so there's a, a great right. solution. And, of course, it does wonderful things for those kids.
Absolutely. With that, we're going to take a break. Much more ahead with Father Spitzer. More of your questions and the topic of pride as we move ahead. Stay with us. We do appreciate you staying with us for part two of Father Spitzer's Universe. We're going to be talking about his book uh, from Father's book, Christ versus Satan in Our Daily Lives. The topic is pride. And we're finishing off with your uh, question. So we're going to get a couple more before we get to the book. Uh, Dear Father Spitzer, I watched the morning mass last week on EW10 and really enjoyed the homilies of the visiting priest. He mentioned that one really hears homilies on mortal sin and going to hell and then proceeded to give an excellent homily on that subject. Why do priests tend to avoid this subject? Do they not want to upset parishioners or could there be some other reason? Linda. Linda, it's pretty much what you say. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of priests do not want to upset parishioners. I, I also think they think that some parishioners might get the wrong idea and um, become, you know, hyper scrupulous, um, you know, in, you know, the, their, you know, their moral lives. Because mm -hmm. remember, you're dealing already with parishioners who are coming to church, mm -hmm. and so, you know, some of them can become uh, very scrupulous, and you know, uh, sort of playing up um, the hell card mm -hmm. uh, can do that. Also, there's probably a fear on the part of many priests that young people will just simply get turned off. Mm -hmm. um, I think if you put the hell topic in the right context and tell them, you know, that hell is really uh, self-chosen and mm -hmm. so forth, um, you know, I, I, I think you can, uh, you know, talk to young people about hell, but if you are kind of, you know, preaching a God who's out there, you know, sending people to hell uh, one after the next, or they get that impression, mm -hmm. Uh, it, it definitely could be a turnoff, um, and you know we've seen a lot of people who, um, you know, have become sort of enemies of the church uh, because you know of too many of those kinds of homilies, and so I think those priests are probably trying to um, step on eggshells. But right. I really do think that you can do a very good job talking about the danger of hell because it is chosen right, right. we're the we're the ones that you know prefer the dark side uh you know we're the ones that think that we're going to be really happy uh following you know uh the eight deadly sins you know power and pride and mm -hmm. envy and lust and greed and we're the ones that you know that they kind of follow the lead uh, into the point of you know emptiness alienation and loneliness uh, not only because we've mm -hmm. alienated all the people around us but because we've alienated ourselves from God uh, we're the ones that s say God hold off here I, I think I gotta follow the darkness it looks really good right now mm -hmm. and so if we tell young pe people the right way about hell uh, if we really tell them that this is a danger and this is why Christ has warned us so heavily against it, if we really do tell them, you know, that, that mortal sins, okay, they could, can be hard to commit insofar as you can't have an impediment to the free use of your will, but eventually you can create a habit around, you know, sinning mortally, et cetera, mm -hmm. and, and that this is a real danger to your spiritual life, et cetera. If we put it in the right way mm -hmm. and we discuss it the right way, I think you could do it, but it is a very difficult subject to bring up. And, um, you know, uh, I once was actually talking about, you know, evil spirits, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in a, in a context at a lecture, and I had a teacher stand up and say, these kids have enough problems without having to consider, you know, the problems of evil spirits and hell. I said, well, 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 just a minute, just a minute. I said, so you're basically saying hide evil spirits and hell from them because they'll feel better uh, in the short term? 
I said, that's not a very good strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, go ahead, you know, start playing in the streets. Don't worry about it. It's going to be okay. Those vehicles look scary, but they're really not. Right. And uh, they really don't exist. Don't worry about that. You know, I said, this, this is a terrible strategy. Yep. If you have a good friend, the one thing you want to tell them is the truth. Right. If you have a good friend, the one thing you want to say is, you know, if you start getting into this th stuff, look at these statistics, right? It's not just going to be that your emotional health is ruined. It's not just going to be that you're going to have a, a skyrocketing increase in depression rates, anxiety rates, and suicide rates. But also, your spiritual life is going to get ruined. If you start going down this path, right, and we know you start, for example, the more time you read pornography, the, 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 you know, the more you can just absolutely depend depend on this, the more um, your uh, prayer life will decrease, your attendance at religious service will decrease until it goes down to nothing. And, and so the, it, we know that, you know, right from a Pew survey, these are all secular surveys. By the way, that was the University of Oklahoma uh, uh, survey um, uh, that was done on the, uh, the relationship between prayer life and, and pornography. If you go the same route with um, a homosexual lifestyle, you can see the very same thing. You'll see your religious life cut in half, uh, time spent on prayer, time, uh, number of uh, religious services attended, and even atheism versus theism, uh, double the rate of atheism almost. So you look at that and you go, hmm, I wonder, uh, is this a lifestyle that's good for my emotional life? Mm -hmm. Heavens no. And is it good for my spiritual life? Double heavens no. So, I mean, the point is, is, you know, you, you, you know it's, it's so clear mm -hmm. from secular surveys, no religious bias, this is not the way to go. Well, what would you do if you had a family member or a friend that you really loved? Wouldn't you want to say, right. don't go out and play in the street? The cars are really real and they can hurt you. Don't you want to say that to your friends and family members? Of course you do. Right. The insanity of keeping it hidden is truly the insane uh, proposition. But it doesn't that anyway, actually I, set I, up I, uh, so many yeah. of these young people to stumble into this stuff because nobody's warned them? Oh, yeah. You know? Oh, they, and also, they think it's a victimless sin. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I have been I, I countless times told by kids that, well, you know, pornography, who does it hurt? doesn't hurt anyone. And I have to say, oh, oh, contraire. Uh, let me just point out these statistics to you. You can expect, expect uh, an increase in depression and anxiety. You can expect a decrease in your religious life. You can expect, uh, expect a, a, um, a tripling of, of your divorce rate. You can expect a doubling of risky sexual behaviors. You can expect that if you do this as a, a younger member uh, of society, that is to say that if you're 16 years of age or younger, mm. that it's going to actually crush your capabilities for emotional intimacy. And by the way, we have 126 good studies on this stuff that all say the same thing. Victimless, you're the first victim, right, and absolutely. then it's your future wife and you know uh, who's not going to get any emotional intimacy from you it's your future children who are not going to get any it's your future addiction that's going to harm the people around you and by the way while you've got a 1.7 times increased chance of job loss your family's going to suffer from the loss of income right. victimless no uh, no this is not a victimless sin and you know this is you know somebody should have told you this earlier but i'm telling you this now right. So that you know that this this is not um, Jesus right. Christ and the church who he uh, that he instituted is absolutely correct right. about um, you know this sin. Sorry, I got going there. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, it was interesting. Recently, I saw an interview with Mary Everstadt, and she was talking about her her recent uh -huh. book, and she was talking about a survey she did, mm -hmm. and had asked a couple of college students at some. Yeah, you she's know, great. Fairly high-end uh, university, asking these two women, uh -huh. "What's the biggest detriment to the dating scene on the college?" And they both said pornography. That that's the biggest yeah. thing, the biggest obstacle yeah. to having relationships, yeah. good, lasting. Yeah, relationships. Yeah, why bother, right? Right. Yeah, uh, I'm I'm just about the sex. Well, now that you know, I've got the sex. Uh, 
Why would I go through the bother of knowing you? So there's no sense of emotional intimacy. There's no sense of starting a family. There's no sense of having children. There's no sense of long-term emotional support. There's no sense of mutual long-term commitment. There's no sense of getting anything on the higher level of eros beyond just sexual gratification. There's no sense whatsoever. Pornography has just shut down the mature emotional development mm -hmm. of young people. Just shut it down. And, and again, study after study. I, I, I wrote this new book, Moral Wisdom of the Catholic Church, mm -hmm. uh, Ignatius just published. And that book has got all those studies in it. And it's just, like I said, 126, 127 studies that just show this is a disaster area. And in the quote, in, in the words of several of the researchers, it is becoming, it's on the level of epidemic proportions. Mm -hmm. It's the fastest increasing addiction by far, not just in the U.S., but throughout the world. And so uh, if you think this is victimless, uh, look yeah, at the, ch right. the church is right. The church is 100 percent right, both for your emotional and spiritual and relational and marital life. All four of them, emotional, spiritual, relational, and marital. Mm -hmm. So I would just say, oh, no, this, this is a disaster area of epidemic proportions. And I think those researchers, are secular researchers, right. are right on the marker. Just before we get to uh, Satan's Tactics, page 328, I was mm -hmm. wondering when you said, is there such a thing as a, uh, a, a, a sin that doesn't impact negatively people? Oh, I know. I think when Jesus declares something to be a sin, he doesn't do it arbitrarily. He's saying this completely conflicts right. with the kind of caritas or agape love that I have come to teach, the unselfish love, the love that cares in action and not just cares in feeling, the love that actually, um, you know, will not only sacrifice uh, um, oneself for the good of the other, but will actually serve the other without feeling, uh, be, you know, servile, right. but uh, it's it service out of love for the other. A and so the idea of serving one's, even one's children and family, you know, be because of love is a good and honorable thing. Commitment uh, is the carrying out of that love consistently over the long term for the good of the spouse and the children. That's self-sacrificial love. That's good. And of course, you know, if we are, you know, sinning, you know, if we're doing something that the church declares to be sinful, you can be sure that this sin is contrary to that notion of good love, that what we call caritas love or agape love that Jesus has defined. And if it's against that form of love, you can be sure it'll affect your emotional life, it'll affect your relational life, it'll affect your marital life, and it'll affect above all your spiritual life. And by the way, it gives rise to criminal activity. Yeah. I mean, you know, when you say, oh no, pornography never has any, uh, you know, effects. I mean, it leads to risky sexual behaviors on a colossal level, not just to the extent that you could lose your job, but to the extent right. that you could ruin your reputation. And all I can tell you is, right. um, you know, <clears throat> all these consequences are right there. Jesus didn't give us rules <coughs> just to give us rules. Right. Jesus gave us rules because these rules are the little gems that lead to virtue and protect us from the evil one, right. protect us from sin, protect us from all those emotional consequences, spiritual consequences, and relational and marital consequences. He's giving this to us because it's for our good, and without them, Right. We are powerless you before the darkness into which we're entering. Do you think there's a connection ahead, between the expansion of pornography everywhere and the kind of sex trafficking we hear about more today? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because the sex trafficking uh, basically is a manifestation of looking for, as it were, the innocent victim, right? Mm -hmm. So why would somebody want to do something heinous and horrible to a little kid like this? Mm -hmm. Why would you want to do this? And the, the, action, the answer is because 
they don't, you know, they're, they're kind of like in this period of not hating you for it. They're in a period of just being confused, mm. depressed, and then, you know, battered for the rest of their lives. But they're not going to hate you on the spot. And so if, it's the easy victim, as it were. Mm. But where does all that come from? I mean, it's obviously this self-gratification, um, you know, a dimension of pornography. The ease, well, you know, there's, it's just a picture. Mm. Yeah, but it's killing you now, and it's going to kill your capacity for emotional intimacy in the future. Of course you're going to start taking riskier and riskier sexual behaviors as you begin to read this stuff. Of course you're going to become more and more depressed. Mm. And of course you're going to deprive your family of, of, of your emotional intimacy because you have none. And of course you're going to have an increased chance of losing your job and a triple increased rate in, in becoming divorced because of the other sexual partner in the family, namely the p pornography addiction. Right. So the, the key thing is, you know, you look at it and you go, yeah, uh, this, this is a pretty serious deal. And um, uh, again, you know, people just, it's so limited. If you really want to believe, you know, there's no harm in it. That's your mythology, mm -hmm. but Jesus is the one who's right. right. Jesus is the one who's telling you for your own good, stop it before it kills you, kills the people you love, and kills the possibility of your having efficaciousness and intimacy going into the future. Right. Just stop it. It's highly addictive, and of course, uh, I, I put in this book, there's a whole lot of things you can do if you're already on the brink of addiction. You can get software put onto your computer, you know, that, um, right. and, you know, there's um, right. software that will control it, that blocks it, and you can even get software where people will help you. So you get into a group of, you know, co-responsible people mm -hmm. who, um, uh, you know, try to help one another to, to um, stay away from uh, porn, and if they see that you're watching it, you know, they call it, it to your attention. You can also get in all kinds of groups, uh, you know, Sex Addicts Anonymous, uh, um, et cetera, et cetera, and there's all, they're all listed in the moral wisdom of the Catholic right. Church. Um, I just put together a whole list of them because you may, if you're on the brink of addiction, you probably will need some help to get over. And by right. the way, there's some very, very good uh, Catholic resources uh, that are out there as well, and I've got those Catholic resources listed uh, in the book as well. Okay, and uh, of course the book would be available through the EWTM Religious Catalog upcoming exactly. as well. But let, in the last couple of minutes, let's uh, get on. I thought it was interesting uh, because you sure. mentioned, uh, uh, you talk about uh, pride and that's what we're talking about and you say in uh, the mm -hmm. idea of the five stages of growth and pride that are con concomitantly five stages and you kind of use these words before decline of empathy, conscience, mm -hmm. care, and love. I, is that always what happens with all of these things? Well, I think in, this, in the case of pride, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, pride is, you know, where you get into this super arrogant mode, the super egotistical mode. Well, the moment your ego reigns over your capacity for empathy, both of them are in us, right? Uh, you know, we're born into the world with self-consciousness. We've got a capacity to be very selfish indeed. Uh, you know, when a, a child, you can see uh, the ego egotism in the child, but you can also see the empathy in the child. Child loves the mother, doesn't want the mother to suffer, et cetera, et cetera. So you can see, you know, there's the pulling, mm. you know, back and forth. But once the ego gets control over the pride and starts crushing out the empathy, right, slowly but surely it crushes out the empathy. And once you crush out the empathy, it's very, very hard to have, I mean, to, you know, you can go through the entire passion of Jesus Christ and as St. Teresa of Avila put it, not shed a single holy tear mm -hmm. right I mean you can just uh, it, it, because you know it's you know it's not because you're unemotional it's just there's nothing there mm -hmm. uh, you don't empathize at all with the Lord you don't see all the good things that he has given you know you in your life you don't see the redemption and the protection from the evil spirit that he's wrought for you by this action of complete self-sacrifice and love and because of that you just you know it's not just the religious decline it says you, know, you don't have any empathy for anybody else either which means that it's very hard to have a compassionate moment 
a caring moment, a serving moment, or you know, or, or you know, even a, a moment where you you'd, you'd think, gee, you know, I mean, you know, this person, you know, uh, uh, you know, he has a family. I I, I can't harm him. Mm. I can't jeopardize his salvation. There's no such feeling in you at all. You know, you just think, ah, that person's better off dead. Pew! You know, Hitler style. You know, right. you, you, you know, it's like a, a a complete loss of empathy. And so, you know, in a way, when pride gets out of control, you're creating little sociopaths, and right, um, right, and exactly. you can see it. You can, yeah, you can see the sociopathic, uh, um, you know, uh, mentality and the sociopathic absence of feeling. Uh, that begins to sort of take over, and that's why this sin. Everybody says, "Well, pride, you know, is rather harmless." I mean, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the guy's just an arrogant fool. People can ignore him. Oh no, mm -hmm. oh no. Once they begin to think that they're the Messiah, once they don't have any empathy for anybody, uh, no, you're creating a little Hitlerian sociopath. Now, of course, it may not be as serious right. as Hitler, but you know, you can get uh, good old Yagos out there. Right. You can get, uh, you know, um, good old Macbeths out right. there. Uh, you know, they don't care who they harm in their process to gain power. They don't uh, care who they harm in their little chessboard to get ahead in the world. And there's lots of those sociopaths out there who are basically using people right and left to climb the ladder, using people right and left to get a few more bucks, using people right and left, jeopardizing their salvation, not just jeopardizing their salvation, their emotional well-being, jeopardizing their families to get a little further ahead in the world. Mm -hmm. There's tons of them out there, but that's the way it works. I mean, once that kind of, you know, we, we don't say, I want to, you know, ch choose the standard of Jesus Christ. I want to choose the standard of humility. Once we allow the egotism to get going, man, it can get way out of hand before you know it. And uh, I can tell you, yeah. uh, I've got plenty of ego in me. <laughs> and boy, if I, if I let that ego go, I mean, it, it really, um, it, you know, you begin to, you, you get a changed personality right. uh, overnight. And, uh, you know, and, and I'm telling you, instead of the Lord being in the center of your universe, you're thinking right. you're the, the Lord of other people right. in your universe. Well, you make and that. And that's, uh, that's right. a bad deal. And you make the point and, yeah. and the idea of the dominant ego, uh, the strong belief in one's inherent superiority, the desire to make one's belief yeah. inherent superiority felt within the external world to so start yourself, and then you press your advantage. And, and a choice actually to be mm -hmm. despotic, and that's where you get to that point of kind of like the Messiah complex. And I thought this was, to maintain yeah. this delusion, the subject must believe that mm -hmm. he has transcended good and evil or rejected the idea of good and evil in total. Yeah, that's right. Oh no, that's the Nietzschean proposition, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, his book is entitled Beyond Good and Evil. And so uh, at that point, you know, you just say, I don't need any of these rules. I, I, I'm the Messiah, I'm the rule setter, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you see it definitely in Hitler. And of course, this is the brilliance of Shakespeare uh, in, in Macbeth, you mm -hmm. know, eventually he's beyond it all until finally, of course, uh, conscience starts to, to get him a, a smidge. Mm -hmm. But still, at the end, he's still questing after power, uh, even as his friend comes and, as they say, runs him through uh, with a sword. But the, uh, the point that, you know, that, that, that's, uh, that's clear is that, you know, um, at, the illusion persists. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to get rid of it once you have it. It's right. very hard to think, to step over the line and think, I'm beyond good and evil. You know, I'm, I'm kind of the, the precedent setter and go back to being a subservient, you know, um, a slave to doing good right. and avoiding evil. Once you've suppressed your conscience, once you've uh, sort of, you know, uh, uh, annihilated it, really, it's very hard to get it back, which is why you never want to go down the dark road mm. that far to the point or, you know, like a, a sort of the old mafia guy that pulls out the gun and he says, well, first it was really hard to kill people, but, you know, then I kind of got used to it. And mm -hmm. Now I kind of like it, you know. Mm -hmm. It gives me a, a real sense of power when I get to kill innocent victims and, you know, hear them scream, you know. I, I, you know, I kind of like it, you know. Well, once you're at that stage, how are you going to go back? You know, it's, it's just like... Uh, 
uh, it's very, very difficult. Or once you're at the state, it doesn't have to be a gun, mm -hmm. you know, where you're killing innocent victims. It just you could be, you know, you know, uh, you know, killing innocent victims in a, in a marketplace, in a job place, and you know, uh, in all kinds of different settings in a political environment. Uh, need I say more? And so the. Uh, uh, the the victims of abortion, you know, I, you know, I, I I'm beyond all that, you know, killing innocent children in the womb. There's nothing wrong with it. I'm telling you, uh, you know, I've, I've got it all all down myself. You know, I'm a politician. I'm, you know, I'm at the top of the world. I can declare this, and I'm telling you, all that church stuff is wrong. All that stuff that I used to feelings that I used to have in my conscience and admitted it in pre previous times, well, I've now arrived at the point right. where I know that I'm right and all that other conscience, moral, um, you know, uh, underpinning stuff right. and religion is all wrong. Uh, uh, boy, when you get to that, I'm telling you, how do you get out of the dark right. side? Absolutely. How do you turn course and, and start saying, well, maybe, maybe I was wrong. How could the Messiah be wrong? How could the that's superego right. be wrong? Well, that's where it always has to be somebody else. Be has to be wrong. somebody else's fault and responsibility. It couldn't possibly be mine. Yeah. But let's start with trying yeah. to save the world with uh, you giving us a prayer on the way out the door. How about that? <laughs> Very good. Uh, and bow your heads and pray for God's blessing. And may the Lord, who truly does give us uh, the truthful, the complete, and a definition of love, which will bring us to the fulfillment not only of our natures, but to help us to uh, be the fulfillment of others' natures through that love and through God Himself. Send His Holy Spirit down upon you to guide, inspire, and protect you so that everything you do will be brought to fruition in his will unto your salvation in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Father Spitzer. As always, stay well, and we shall see you next week. And don't forget that Father Spitzer's books and DVDs are naturally available through the EWTN Religious Catalog. Next week's show, we continue talking about pride. And, of course, our bookmark, I wanted to mention, Everything You Need to Know About Abortion for Teens, it's uh, by Janet Morana, obviously against that, of course. And be sure to join us uh, for all our pro-life events we were talking about earlier, happening the rest of this week and into the weekend. Our coverage begins Thursday at 5 p.m. Eastern. Opening Mass at the National Prayer Vigil, always very popular. Our annual coverage of the March for Life from D.C., live beginning 9.30 a.m. Eastern time. This will be followed by the Walk for Life West Coast and One Life L.A. on Saturday. Check out EW10.com for days and times in your area for all of our special pro-life programming. Some of it might be on demand. Some of it may be repeated. Check it out. Check it out on our YouTube channel. I'm Doug Keck. Check us out next time when we once more re-enter Father Spitzer's universe. We'll see you then.